Hello everyone, reporting today for Fun Robotics Network. I'm Abbas, and with me here is none other than Team 11260 Apple Creek Robotics. They have just been absolutely unbelievable this entire season. Pretty much the first flip-flop, the most successful flip-flop. This goes on and on. Just insane. I can't wait to jump into this on Behind the Bot. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. StudiCut Robotics is everything your team needs to build, learn, and compete. Check out their FTC starter kit, intake hub kit, and odometry wheel options at studica.com slash robots. Teams in the USA can get up to 25% off and apply for grants at studica.com slash robots. True competitors know that every second counts. That's why Kettering University challenges you to dive in right away as a first-year student. Participating in robotics programs helps Kettering students secure a valuable co-op. Whatever your interest, Kettering gives you more space to work faster and win faster. Learn more at kettering.edu slash first. Okay, guys, so, I mean, the first question is obviously why ClipBot? I think every season you consistently push the bounds of what's been done in FTC. Why did you choose the ClipBot as that architecture this year? Yeah, I think what we really wanted was a challenge. So this is the kind of thing we were kind of thinking about it and theorizing as soon as the game came out, um, because there wasn't actually any rules about possessing um, more than one clip, but we thought that they were gonna make it illegal, right? And then two weeks later, they released the first game update and it became explicitly allowed. The robot can hold as many as you want um, and you can make your own specimens. And from there, we realized that this is really something we wanted to do, not just because it's a, a very strong strategy and it saves us a lot of time on our cycles, but also because it's something that would make for a really memorable and fun season. Yeah, absolutely. And from that cycle time perspective, really quick, in your initial brainstorming and strategizing, what sort of improvements were you seeing, like just from like general points or percentages? Talk to talk to me about that. I think um, there it, it really helps with the cycle time because you're not you don't have to move at all. And where that really shows improvements is how you're able to do these cycles concurrently. So we're have, able to have, especially in autonomous, our intake is running at the same time as our depositor is running, at the same time as our clipper is running. And since we're not moving, we can be intaking and depositing almost at the same time. And that really helps a lot, especially in autonomous. Awesome, yeah. And so we're gonna start with the intake, then talk about the clip loading mechanism, then the clipping, then the deposit. So let's jump into the intake. Lots of degrees of freedom there. Walk me through the general ones, and then I have a bunch of specific questions. Yeah, so our intake has one degree of freedom that is the extension. This extension is powered by um, a car antenna actuator, which is a nylon rod that pushes through these telescoping tubes. Um, you can see it's over there. And then we have a turret, a four bar pivot, and another degree of freedom on the intake itself to pick up from any orientation. And yeah. So about that car antenna, just going back to it briefly, why? Was it a space concern? Just some mechanism you really wanted to try out? Is there a huge benefit to it? I think um, it's it's worked really well for us and it is really efficient with the space. So this is the entire assembly of what it looks like. It connects to the motor on the end here, as you can see. And so this is really compact um, with the actuator. It means that our extension can be very compact um, and all of the actual mechanisms is back inside of the robot and that works better awesome. with how we were designing. Yeah, now jumping into the bearing and turret situation, what's the like? What's the basis of your turret right here? I would say, um, yeah, we, we have a, a large bearing on the bottom here. It's powered by an Axon servo underneath. Um, you won't be able to see the bearing, but you can see the servo is connected to a servo horn inside of there and then yeah, and now I also see you have the four bar mechanism over here. So why the four bar as compared to, you know, we've seen a lot of belted designs, things like that, but you just, you were able to get the range of motion with the traditional four bar right there? Yeah, exactly. So we had a, lots of different things. Originally, this was just a bar that would extend to the intake as a pivot. But the issue with that is that it would extend outside, out of the, the side of our robot. And we thought that that would be very dangerous, especially since we have a really light intake. So what we did instead, we use this four bar. It allows us to go down to the right height and extend up and retract within our robot while still staying under the top bar. Awesome, yeah, now jumping into the claw right there, I see a lot of little alignment mechanisms here and there walking through how your claw works. Sure, so our claw um, is picking them up from the inside, like I mentioned. It aligns with these um, claw shapes. These are something we've tried and iterated on a bunch of times. Right now we have um, these kinds of triangle things that will center to the inside of the block and be able to spread to catch the um, to catch the inside. 
Um, yeah, and as far as sensorization goes, in the claw alone, is it like beam brakes, anything like that, or no sensors needed? We used to use a beam brake sensor, but we found um, an alternative is a, a stall detector circuit um, that we run inside of our robot. And what that does is, as it is opening, as soon as it fully opens in order to grab one of the samples, as soon as it fully opens to grab one of the samples, the servo will stall, and with that um, detection, detecting that it has stalled, we're able to know whether or not we've intake a sample, and we can use that to automate our autonomy. Yeah, absolutely. Now, jumping a little into the software behind all of this, uh, starting with loop times, I feel like that's got to be a pretty big concern when you have all of these things running in parallel. Anything you want to talk about there, how you sped them up, made them very consistent, talk to me about that. Yeah, so we structure our code as a sep few separate subsystems that work independently and each one as it's obviously runs in the background a constant read update um the big thing about the intakes for loop times was vision and getting those loop tucked down our loop times we use our parent open cv and that's kind of the big that, that's really the big fault on our loop times a lot as well as i smart c channels um so to get those down bulk reading has been a big effort um we do that and then otherwise loop times they're mostly in the vision system. All right, yeah, so let's jump right into the vision. We've seen a lot of limelight usage this year. Not you guys, though, so walk me through the camera you're using, why you used it. Yeah, we opted not to use limelight because we really wanted a big FOV with a lot of control over our vision system. That is a 120 degree field view global shutter web camera. And our vision system, we have a picture of kind of our pipeline up here, um, right up there. That shows how we basically we take the image we undistort it that's a really big step in vision to have nice geometry so you can find things we then take a perspective transform a homography and then from there there's a lot of each season is a lot of minute open cv kind of fiddling around find what's the best way you can get a consistent detection and the big thing there is to get your loop times down is try to do bulk operations when you can and isolating your regions of interest so we do i think about three steps of like finding contours, then doing edge detection to really narrow down what we care about before we do more expensive operations like temple matching. <laughs> yeah, and so now vision, I feel like the concern is always, you have it working fantastically at home, even if you have a conference room at Worlds, you have it working great there, then you get on the field and you know, suddenly everything's, everything's not working anymore. But I mean, you guys have hit that nine specimen, 10 specimen, pretty much every single match. So how have you maintained that consistency? What can teams learn from there? Yeah, a, a big thing we started with was in the calibration time at the start of the tournament, we took pictures with our camera and saved them to our robot, and then we downloaded them onto a computer so we could uh, keep working on vision outside of our calibration time. That was a big help. And then another thing we do is when we're filtering, two, two other big things that help with uh, lighting issues are doing gradient, gradient filters like a Sobel filter. Or there's another one, I don't quite remember the name. We use a Sobel filter. Uh, and the last thing being for whenever you're using color filters and like thresholding, we calculate what our thresholds based on a normal distribution yeah. of the color we want rather than any specific HSD yeah. balance and that also helps make it a little more robust. Absolutely. Okay, let's jump into the clip loading mechanism. Walk us through how it works in general and I have a ton of questions after that. All right, so our clip loading mechanism uses this clip claw here that has the capacity for nine clips. Um, at the beginning of autonomous and as well, and also at the beginning of teleop, assuming our autonomous uh, fully hits everything, um, yeah, we pick up the clip, we load the clips onto the wall, and our clip picks them up off the wall all nine at once, and it grips them with this servo and cam. Okay, got it. And I feel like one thing here, you're holding on like just to that thin, uh, you know, web or neck of the clip. Uh, alignment and consistency and accuracy in that must be a challenge. How did you guys address it? Yes, so one thing that we do is we, because of our, our cam, we're able to open the claw very wide um, as well as getting lots of climbing force. So we're able to open it wide, which gives us front and back tolerance. We also um, have tuned the distance of this side panel from the clip to make sure that when we drive right up against the wall, the distance is correct. And then we also drive slightly sideways to make sure all of the clips are aligned this direction in the clip 
yeah that makes a ton of sense now going through the clipping itself once you have them all loaded here how does this mechanism work yeah so starting over here we have a triangular gripper that has um a piece of foam on it um that piece of foam acts as a passive gripper um yeah there we go um with that and that allows us to uh, slide this whole mechanism to any position of the clips along here. Um, another feature of this gripper is that it's coated in Teflon, which allows us to easily slide the clip out without actually opening it much wider. Um, next, we pull the clip back to here and reseat it by pressing it up against this reseater mechanism here. That makes sure everything is perfectly aligned for when the clipping sequence actually starts. Got it, yeah. And now talking about sensorization here, is it uh, you know, all encoder based and just using the servo encoders, motor encoders, if you're using any motors there, or are you also using distance sensors, beam brakes, limit switches? Oh, thank you. Uh, so we started handling mostly with just what we already knew about our clip count. Um, and just in the code, there wasn't any sensors. But as we worked through reliability, we found that it was nice to have this limit switch in the back. And that basically tells us whenever our uh, kind of like back and pinion here hits the back end, you know that it's there and that knowledge kind of lets us stagger our different um mechanisms so that they don't interrupt awesome yeah now you have the clip on you have a sample in the robot what's next yes so the sample will transfer from the intake to the depositor in this area here um it will slide in the depositor will press down this lever here which allows the intake to slide in past this wall um, then it transfers to the depositor and then the depositor lifts up or no it the depositor lifts up and after the transfer and this wall goes up making sure that the sample is held in well there um, then this the clipper mechanism just slides over it and it rotates it's designed to rotate around this center or this clip the center of rotation is right around this clip which um, the it doesn't move the sample too much it reduces any motion on the sample as it's clipping so then it just slides and clips and then it pulls back the second feature of this bar allows it to easily remove itself from the it allows it sorry this second function of this bar allows it to easily pull the clipping mechanism out of the clip which gets everything out of the way so the depositor is able to then score the completed specimen yeah, and you know, I feel like one thing, uh, yeah, as we can hear from that staff there, that people thought would be difficult with the clip box is that torque you need to just really seat that clip in. Is that a challenge you guys faced? If so, you know, how did you work around it? Yeah, so one of our first uh, priorities as soon as we started designing the clipper was get a working prototype to prove this is possible to do. Um, originally, I was assuming we would need some sort of either linkage that gives us a mechanical advantage or gearing of some sort. Um, but pretty quickly we realized that even a Go Build a Torque servo actually has enough torque to clip the or to clip this the specimen. Um, however, uh, to increase reliability, we increased to the highest torque servo that we basically had available to us in Axon Max, and we have had very little. We had some slight issues before, but those have all been fixed, and the torque that this servo provides is plenty to clip without any extra gearing. Okay, and I think the last topic here is gonna be the depositor onto the specimen or onto the chamber itself. I see lots of moving components every time. So yeah, why? Is it just like packaging? You gotta work around all the components of the robot. What's going on there? Yeah, exactly. So the depositor is the mechanism where we definitely spend the most time looking at the packaging and how we could fit it. So instead of having a depositor that's symmetrical around the, mid the center of our robot, for instance, we have um, something that's off to the side, only one set of vertical slides. And that's because um, in, compared to the intake and other mechanisms like that, those require a lot of precision. The depositor does not require a lot of precision. And so we're able to make it pretty simple like that. Yeah, and I'm really interested in this mechanism right here uh, with that ellipsoid. Is it, yeah, walk you through the cam, why this profile, things like that. Right, exactly. So the cam is something we actually use on all three of the, glip, the grippers on a robot. So we also use it on our clip claw and our intake gripper. What this allows us to do is it allows us to use much smaller, much smaller servos to actuate these claws. So if you can see from this side, we use uh, a micro servo right here 
and this makes it much lighter it makes it um it requires less current and the reason that that's able to work is because you get a lot of mechanical advantage from the cam when you're at this horizontal position so you can have a very high grip strength without compromising um, additional current required in your circuit awesome yeah upper creek thank you guys so much i mean you guys have just built a beautiful machine and the programming behind it is also so complex and it's really impressive seeing how it all comes together so reporting for fun robotics network i'm Ab Haas, and this is team 11260 upper creek robotics thank you Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to stay up to date on future fun videos. True competitors know that every second counts. That's why Kettering University challenges you to dive in right away as a first-year student. Participating in robotics programs helps Kettering students secure a valuable co-op. Whatever your interests, Kettering gives you more space to work faster and win faster. Learn more at kettering.edu slash first. Studica Robotics is everything your team needs to build, learn, and compete. Check out their FTC starter kit, intake hub kit, and odometry wheel options at studica.com slash robots. Teams in the USA can get up to 25% off and apply for grants at studica.com slash robots.